Good afternoon, guys. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Thank you for attending. Um, just a couple of um, housekeeping. Uh, first of all, this webinar would be recorded and sent to you after um, the webinar this afternoon. Um, so don't worry about taking any notes. If you have any questions, you can put it on a Q&A or chat. Both of them will check and uh, we'll reply to you or we answer the question at the end of the webinar. Uh, we have here with me, so I'll just introduce myself and let everybody else introduce themselves. I think that would be easiest. I'm Brad uh, from Wise Advice, we are accounting firm. Uh, based in Auckland. Uh, we've been around since 2005, um, so it's been a long time, time flies. Uh, I'm a geeky accountant and we do accounting for the things that lots of other accountants don't like to do. Uh, we deal a lot with Shopify and Amazon and um, also we deal with cryptocurrency, which most of the accountants don't like to touch or know about. Um, we have a team, we have two offices here and we have an office in Melbourne as well. Um, so we cover New Zealand and Australia. Um, for those of you Shopify sellers that sell in Australia as well, uh, we can help you there for registering for GSD or filing GSD there if you um, need to. Um, and I'll be taking you through the accounting side of it. And Cheryl uh, from Beyond Expectation, do you want to go introduce yourself, Cheryl? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Cheryl. I'm from Beyond Expectations. Um, and we are a team of consultants that we work with businesses to help them with their inventory needs, but not only limited to inventory, we work with people that need to get their systems talking to each other. So we help with integration solutions as well. And there'll be many more things that we talk about throughout the course of the session today. So um, that's the element of surprise. We will keep keep talking. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Sharon, do you want to have a quick introduction? Oh, yep, yeah, it'll be quick. I work with Cheryl as well. So we work together at Beyond Expectations. We'll be expecting um, some jokes and entertainment from you, Sharon. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure, and thank you for having me on here. So I work at a company called A2X, which is a software solution that automates e-commerce accounting. So we work with Shopify, sellers, Amazon, eBay, Etsy, uh, all around the world. It was actually originally founded here in New Zealand, and we've yeah kind of launched globally. And we partner with Brad, who uses A2X for his Shopify clients. And we can go a bit more into that uh, later on into the presentation. Cool. Thank you. Um, so everybody can see the presentation on my screen. Cool. So that's um, how we're going to cover today. So I'm going to talk about zero and accounting side of it, and then we move on to Shopify and A2X. Um, so Ellen will do an introduction on A2X, and then I'll do a demo of how A2X would be able to help you with your um, accounting side. And then we'll talk about inventory, which um, Cheryl will be popping and uh, go through that. And at the end of the day, we will um, cover all the questions that you might have. Um, one of the things I want to mention is um, if I can bring this up. So this checklist basically would be available to you guys um, um, when we send the recording. So everything that we talk about, we tend to this checklist. So you can go tick off each item that we talked about in the, um, during the webinar and to make sure that um, you've got everything covered. So don't worry about it. You don't, again, need to take any notes. Um, you can have um, full attention to the content of the webinar and um, hopefully the checklist will cover everything there. So um, let's talk about the accounting side and uh, what you need to cover when you are looking at um, your end of the year or any time. So we talk about end of the year, but these practices are good for any time of the year. Uh, but end of the year is obviously a good excuse to go and um, check them all. First of all is your bank account. Um, one of the assumptions we're making is um, that all of you use zero, but everything that we say here applies to any accounting software that you use as well. But uh, to make it easier, and because we use zero, I'm using zero as an example, 
but if you're using MRB or QuickBook, if you're in Australia, um, it would be exactly the same um, principle. So one of the things that you need to make sure that you do is making sure after you reconcile all your bank um, transaction and your zero or any accounting system, the balance that you see here, it matches the balance in your bank. Some of us um, trust uh, the system quite a lot. And we think, okay, because I um, linked my bank fee to uh, my zero or my accounting system, the balance is going to be correct. That is not the case. Some of the banks, they have outage throughout the year. Um, some of the feeds from PayPal or Stripe, um, sometimes they crash and they don't send the right information through. So you have to make sure that this balance will match the balance um, in your actual bank account that correlates with that um, bank in your accounting system. So keep in mind that, uh, for example, in zero, it is a day before. Um, so the balance, if we look at it now as a 12 p.m. in New Zealand, if you look at it, you have to compare your bank balance as a end of um, yesterday, which was Tuesday, um, the 1st of March, to uh, your bank account, not today's because it's a day behind. And that balance it shows here, this was um, taken before, that's 21st of February. Um, so make sure that balance is matching with the other balance you have. The other thing that will happen um, sometimes, and we see that quite a bit, is um, when you reconcile everything, if you see this difference, don't ignore it. Because that difference um, is a problem and you have to um, fix that problem. Um, so there is a balance in zero. So in zero, it uh, looks like that you have $2,719 uh, balance in your bank account. But in actual bank statement, uh, if that is correct, as we mentioned before, uh, you have $1,886. Um, so th there is a difference between the two and you have to address that to make sure um, that um, your accounts are correct. So if I show you the screen and... Um, zero, if I can get my zero up and running here. Nope, the zero doesn't want to come up. So in zero, you will see, I think I've got it here actually. Okay, I've got it here. So if you go to your uh, statement uh, and if you click on this status a couple of time, um, it will sort them based on the status. So if you see this all, orange one, that uh, means this is unreconciled. So what that means is, for example, this is a received money. So that means somebody gone and put an invoice um, that that invoice has been paid for $833.33. And that invoice has been marked as paid, but that payment of the $833.33 never been received in your bank account that you coded on. Or you might have coded it two times. So you've gone and said, okay, this invoice is paid. And then you have found this amount as well before and you coded as a sales without reconciling against the invoice. So that means you accounted for that uh, sales two times. And if you look at your profit and loss report, you might not notice it, but you're actually paying tax for that $833.33. Um, and if you don't, um, basically fix that, you paid, uh, paid um, that more. And that amount could be $8,000, which we had this uh, with uh, one of our newer clients. They had 8,700, something like exactly like that, that they paid tax on, which they shouldn't have because they never received that money um, as extra money. So make sure that you check that. So that's um, about your bank account. Then the other thing you have to check is your account um, account receivable and account payable. Um, we're gonna cover that a bit more in, uh, when we talk about A2X, but one of the things you have to check, you have to go to your account receivable um, in your dashboard and make sure that um, your account receivable is um, correct. And uh, it's showing um, all the invoices that you actually um, gonna get paid for, um, not any other, um, other invoices. So if I just try one more time, see if I can show my zero. Doo, doo, doo. Yay, I can show zero. Um, so if 
And basically you're looking at these uh, $6,978, make sure, click on those and make sure all of these invoices are actually valid invoices that people haven't paid you. Because sometimes you might have connected um, another API to your, um, to your zero, especially the Shopify native uh, APIs that you might have um, connected to zero. And that would push lots of individual invoices and people ignore this because it become a painful thing. They ignore it and say, okay, I'm not worried about them, but those invoices are paid. And then your um, profit and loss report and your tax return is based on an invoice. So everything in accounting, when we do the tax return is based on accrual base. So it's based on the invoices. Even if the invoice is sitting there, and they're not valid invoices, they're gonna show as an income and you're gonna pay tax on it. So make sure those invoices are valid, okay? Um, then um, things like this happen. Uh, in this case, you see that invoices, um, for this client, we had to go and, um, because they just keep ignoring those invoices, we deleted 2000 or avoided, you can't delete the invoices in zero. We had to avoid 24,929 invoices because they had a link between the um, system that they were using and zero and all just individual invoices. So they had about 100 sales a day or so. And every day, 100 invoices will come to zero. And it just built up, built up after a while. So do not ignore those invoices that come and uh, because it will create an um, issue. And this case, um, this client paid $70,000, so it shows $70,000 more income profit last year in 2021, uh, because those invoices were sitting there and um, the accountant didn't notice, they didn't know that these are paid. And um, because as I say, it's based on accrual, they paid tax on the 70,000 more income that they shouldn't have. So that's about $20,000 roughly of extra tax payment that they would have paid, which we um, getting refined for them now. So make sure that these invoices are, are not sitting there, do not ignore them. The same thing should be for account payable. So um, go through your account payable, make sure everything that is your account payable are um, actually valid. So if you've paid them and the invoice sitting there from last year, um, then either find that transaction and reconcile it against the invoice or just void those invoices and get rid of them because it's going to create a problem um, and uh, it would be a reverse. So you under um, reporting your um, profit by having those invoices there. For receivable invoices, the other thing that you have to do, you have to write off all your bad debts before end of March. So before end of the March financial year, for those of you in Australia, obviously your June uh, uh, year, uh, for US I think is um, December, but for those of you in New Zealand end of March, make sure that you write off your bad debts. And um, when you write off your bad debts, um, you have to show evidence that you've done anything in your power to recover those debts, obviously. You can't just say, okay, I'll write it up. You have to send the emails, give them a call, send them to the debt recovery, do everything that you can to make sure that you recover that. If you haven't recovered it, then you can write it off as a bad debt. Because if it's sitting there $40,000, $10,000, whatever amount is, and you're not gonna get ever paid for it, why you wanna pay tax uh, for it at the end of the year? So you wanna write it off so um, it comes after your profit. So that's all about your invoices. One of the things that um, business owners don't look at is your balance sheet. Your balance sheet is a very important part of your business, but most of the business owner don't understand it and try to avoid it. They look at the profit and loss report and that's about it. So make sure you check your balance sheet uh, for different things because certain things will sit there and then uh, you might not notice it. So in a balance sheet, um, the things that are important, it's all the loans um, that you given as a company to others or others given to you and make sure all those balances are making sense. So all your liabilities um, should be um, there recorded and the balances should be okay. The other thing is um, there are accounts like a suspense account that some people usually put things there that they're not going to deal with. 
and the things go there and the stock there. So just go have a look and see what is on your balance sheet and make sure you understand it. Um, there is a guide um, in, um, in our checklist, uh, which is uh, basically, I'll have a screenshot of it here, that explains what each line in a balance sheet is and what do they mean. So you can download that to understand your balance sheet and make sure it makes sense. Um, sometimes we find out like there was a family loan between the company and um, you and, you know, funny things sitting there and it's been sitting there forever and the balance doesn't change ever, which might be the case, but um, it's good to study that and make sure your balance sheet is in the right track. And also check anything like a suspense account, as I said, um, it should be, the balance should be zero at the end of the year and there shouldn't be any balance there. So if there is something there, you might uh, not fix it, but at least you can highlight it with the accountant and see what's going on there. The next one is a GST. So the GST is um, a very important part and we're gonna talk about it uh, a bit more detail when we talk about A2X, but one of the things that is happening and I see more and more is when you import um, things uh, to New Zealand or to any country, I think, um, the sales tax or GST is charged at the entry. So the invoice would look like this. We have seen so many people that they paid that $12,245.80. This is the actual invoice that I cut out and did a screenshot of it. This client, coded that as a cost of goods sold uh, for the purchases or coded as custom uh, import, import cost or something. Um, so what would have happened if he did it as an import cost with the GST on it? He claimed 15% of that amount as a GST uh, when he filed his GST return, which is totally wrong. Out of this invoice, um, there is a breakdown here. So as you can see, there is a $951.40, which is um, a custom duty, which doesn't have any GST. So this part doesn't have any GST, first of all. There is an entry fee of $51.72 that has got $7.76 of GST. So that's a 15% of that $51. So that's a GST amount. And there is $11,234.92 of GST. So the whole thing is GST. So that $11,000 is GST. So you have to make sure that this is break down to the different components and GST is accounted for. So we have two extremes. So one extreme is the one that I told you that they put it as an import, um, import cost and they claim 15% GST. They have another extreme as well that they get that $1,200 and they code it as GST. Um, and that is wrong as well. So either way is wrong. Make sure that if you don't know how to code this, have a chat with your accountant, uh, but make sure you break it down to these items. So this it's a bit more complicated than um, it looks. The other things about GST is make sure um, that your registration for any country, whether you're in New Zealand or um, you're selling to the overseas, um, your GST um, obligation, you understand whether you have to register for GST or not. If you're in New Zealand, obviously 60K is a threshold. So if you're just starting or started um, and you haven't reached that amount, then when you get to the any 12 months, your turnover is more than 60K, you have to register for GST. Um, some people um, get that wrong as well because they don't price the things um, with GST. Um, so GST is never your money. So when you're pricing, always imagine that 15% of it is not yours if you're selling to consumer because if you sell something for $30, 15% of it is not yours. You have to pay it back to RD, okay? Um, and people get upset. So when they're not GST registered and suddenly they register for GST, 15% of your revenue is gone. Um, so when you price it in the beginning of your business, you always assume that you're going to be GST registered at some stage and you're going to be paying 15% of that revenue to RD because um, increasing that price later might be a bit painful. So keep that in mind. Um, the other thing that we've seen in Shopify that people... Um, when they sell in multiple country, they don't click on uh, tax um, in the Shopify. The tax sitting on your Shopify should be correct. Otherwise, whatever we push to um, uh, zero is gonna be wrong. So one case we had, 
Uh, we had a client that they sell in New Zealand and Australia. They didn't set the tax up. So everything was going as um, no tax. Um, so, but they are GSC registered in New Zealand um, and they sell a lot in Australia as well. So when um, you look at your zero, everything doesn't, there's no GST accounted for. Even if we use A2X or any other system to push the information, there was no tax um, showing there because everything was coming as not tax. Then what happened, it was an interesting uh, event because I told them, okay, click on that thing. Um, let's say it was $40 they were selling um, that item in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, when I asked them to uh, push the thing to add the tax, I received the call next day. And he said, hey, uh, this is not okay because now we're selling things a lot cheaper in Australia. I said, how much cheaper? I said, about 15% cheaper. I said, okay. <laughs> That's exactly the same as you have in New Zealand. That 15% is not your money. It's a GSC that you're paying to RD. But from your point of view, you think the Australian guys um, are paying you less, but they're paying you exactly the same amount of money because they're not paying GSC. It looks like if they're paying you I don't know, $36, but the New Zealand ones, they're paying you $40, but that $40, the 15% of it gonna go for GSC return. But you don't feel that in the beginning, you think they pay you $40, but they're not paying you more. So this is an, another important concept that you need to get it right in your head that um, GSC is not your money. Um, whatever you do, you look at it without GSC. When you look at your profit and loss report in zero, it doesn't have any GSC as well. So look at everything without GSC. Sorry, GSC is my pet hate. <laughs> I see a lot about it. Assets. Um, look at your asset list before you um, send it because you guys especially use lots of technology. You use your laptop and MacBook and iPhone and God knows camera for taking photo of your products and all that. And these things will disappear after a couple of years. The battery doesn't charge anymore. They have updates and they have a better camera and all sorts. So they either write off or you sell them on trade me or something. If you sold them, you have to let your accountant know. If they are write off and they're not existed anymore, you have to let your accountant know. We see these asset um, um, registry, which lots of asset that they don't exist anymore, but they just in the in the um, depreciation schedule in the asset list. Um, so if you see anything like that in your asset list, make sure to report it um, to your um, accountant. The other thing that has happened for New Zealand one out there, uh, for the Kiwis out there, that doesn't apply to anybody else. So we have a rule, if anything, uh, we had a rule back in uh, 2000, I have to get the years right, um, in the year 2020, financial year 2020, which is March 2020, up to March 2020, anything less than $500 um, as an asset. So if I buy a um, desk for $499, I could write it off as an expense. So I don't have to register it as an asset and depreciate it every year. I already said, okay, it's not worth it to depreciate it, that asset and you can go claim it as expense, which helps with the tax as well. Between the 1st of March 2020, sorry, 1st of April 2020 till end of March 2021, that first year of COVID, that's how we know that year, first year of COVID, um, RD um, said, okay, to help businesses with the financials, we increase that to $5,000. So anything up to $5,000. So if you buy a very fancy uh, MacBook and it's 4,000 something dollars, you could have claimed it as an expense. You didn't have to register it for asset and depreciate it every year. Or if you buy a Toyota Corolla of 1997 for $5,000, you could have claimed it as an expense. You didn't have to uh, register it for uh, as asset. So that was between that period. From 1st of April, 2021 onwards, that limit is $1,000. So it's gone from 500 to 5,000 and now is a standard $1,000. So anything that you purchase, Less than $1,000, you don't need to register it as an asset. You can write it off as expense, and that helps you with your tax. So, um, yeah, $1,000 is quite a bit. So for your office furniture and things like this, for scanners, for your warehouse and things like this, you can easily claim those as expense. 
um, expenses or income. Uh, so make sure that your income is break down to the different categories because at the end of the day, as I mentioned before, the GST is one thing. So this New Zealand one have GST. Um, in this case, if you look at the top uh, one, Australian one, um, they're selling a lot in Australia. And in Australia, if you sell more, if your turnover is more than 75, okay, then you have to register for GST. So if you don't have this report, you never know that you've gone over $75,000 in Australia. But I'm looking at this and say, no, you have to register for GST in Australia and you have to pay GST in Australia, which is 10% compared to the 15% here. Um, so these reports are important for you when you do your business planning to see how much uh, you sell. Some people say, oh, I can see that in, uh, in Shopify. That's not enough because you have to account for everything in zero as well as far as accounting is complicated and you have to separate these things. So make sure your regions and everything are separated and um, in zero. Um, and we'll talk about it in A2X on how to do it. Last thing here, I think it's expenses. So because most of you working from home, this is a, this is a garage, I assuming of a Shopify seller with lots of stock in their garage. Um, one of the things that you can claim is your home office expenses uh, as a business owner, uh, but more and more of us using our home. So for us, for some of us, like we have two offices, I'm working from home now. I'm using my power at home, I'm using my internet at home, I'm using uh, one room at home. Um, this is my office and I can claim this percentage of the house. So I measure this room compared to the whole house and the percentage I can claim from my rent or mortgage interest and I can claim um, part of the power and everything else in the house. So make sure that you do that for those of you, obviously Shopify sellers, uh, because you're using the storage and other things, your percentage usually is higher. Um, so make sure you measure those parts of the house. You might use your kitchen counter as a packing um, line, or I don't know, you might glue things and make things nice, depending on what you're selling. So make sure you measure those and um, provide it to your accountant as a home office expenses so you can claim those um, there as well. And tax is the last one. I lied, expense wasn't the last one, tax. Uh, we've seen a huge growth in our e-commerce businesses. So all of our e-commerce clients growing like mad, which is great for you guys. But that brings tax and accounting for those tax as far as the cash flow to make sure you have enough money put aside uh, for your tax. So it's a good time to have a chat with the account and say, hey, let's see, have a chat about my tax because um, when you pay tax, uh, if your tax and liability is more than $5,000, then you have to pay provisional tax, which is a prepaid tax that you have to pay every year before the year ends. So the first year, usually you pay the tax, like if you finish end of 2020 and you've um, like end of this month and your tax is $10,000 um, or $20,000 or whatever it is because you growth suddenly, um, then, and if you were not in a provisional tax before, if you were, you know how it is, how it feels. But if you're not, uh, then for that $20,000, you pay that um, in 2023. So you pay that next year. But throughout this year, from 1st of April to end of March 2023, uh, you have to pay prepaid tax, one in August, one in January, one in May. So 18th of August, 7th of, um, 15th of January, and 7th of May. You pay these three payments as one third, one third, one third of your tax. And if during that year you're growing as well, you have to estimate how, how much is your growth and pay extra to make sure that you have paid enough tax for that year. So make sure that you have a tax planning in place, especially if you're in a growth mode, which I know that 90%, 95% of you guys are growing very fast and you need that. So enough of me, um, Ellen, I'll pass on to you to talk about A2X and then, then I do a um, demo of A2X as well. Yeah, thank you, that was great. So I today I'm gonna to discuss just kind of uh, the brief kind of problems that e-commerce businesses who are selling on Shopify can face. So Brad has gone through and spoken to you about all the different areas that you need to check off. 
Uh, unfortunately, e-commerce accounting is actually really difficult. Uh, Shopify makes it hard. <laughs> they, and you will be aware of this, they pay you in lump sum net deposits um, after fees into your bank account and you need to break them all out. So it actually makes going through that checklist really difficult uh, if you've kind of not stayed on top of things. So I've just got a couple of slides to go over and then um, I will pass back over to Brad who will run you through a demo as he uses A2X for all of his clients. So uh, can you see my screen all right? Yep. Great. So I have just here on the screen an example of a, a kind of a payout. Uh, so as a Shopify business owner, you may be receiving like a net deposit into your bank account. And what you'll notice is that doesn't actually match up with what you know you sold on Shopify. And that's because there is a whole lot of other line items that they've included in that deposit. So in this case, you've been, uh, Shopify has deposited $15,072 into your account, but you actually uh, made sales of 24,678. Now, if you actually went ahead and wrote uh, or kind of wrote down that your sales were 15,072, you've actually missed out a lot of crucial information uh, in that. Um, so you've actually here, you can see you've actually got shipping income in there. You've got GST collected, which as Brad mentioned, is not your money. You need to be putting that aside. You've got gift card liabilities. You could have pending payments, disputes, and that's where how you're left with that deposit. So what happens is A2X can actually solve this problem. So that's exactly why we exist. So A2X um, sits inside, sits in between your e-commerce platform and your accounting system. And it's going to pull in all of the information of all of the financial activity that has happened in your Shopify store. And it's going to send it into zero in a summarized journal entry that is going to match um, to your bank deposits. So it's going to automate a lot of uh, what Brad was speaking about earlier. And more importantly, especially as it comes uh, round to tax time, is A2X can actually retrospectively pull your data. So you can connect, you can sign up to A2X and, A2X, and you can request uh, that rather than just doing your kind of your payments going forward, that we can actually uh, pull all the information and backdate your books. So that's a very brief introduction and I'm sure you're aware of all the kind of the pain points around e-commerce accounting and you're not alone. Uh, it's exactly why A2X was created. It was from an Amazon seller who was facing the same issues. So I will uh, pass back over to Brad who will run you through a um, quick demo so you can see the product. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, you can hear me? Yeah. Cool. So let's see if I can bring up A to X. Um, do, do, do. Into X, yeah. We have some questions uh, on the screen. I'm just going to answer them all at the end if you guys don't mind uh, to make it easier. So let's see if we can see A to X. Can you see my screen, guys? Can you see my screen, Cheryl, Ellen? Yep, yep, I yep. can see your cool. screen. So um, as Ellen mentioned, uh, when you have Shopify or Amazon or Walmart or eBay, um, any any kind of, uh, any of those um, channels, uh, we're talking about Shopify mainly here, but uh, the same rule applies to the other ones. Uh, most of the people, um, there's two scenarios. Most of the people will go receive that 15,000 to say Shopify sells. Um, that creates those issues that Ellen mentioned. Um, you're understating your income, which would be RD problem. Your GST is not correct. Um, if you want to sell your business, think about it. If you want to sell your business and your turnover is a million dollar compared to $800,000, uh, which one do you think would be better for you when you want to sell your business? Um, so in that case, as you saw, it was a $15,000 um, recorded as sales compared to $24,000, the actual sales that you had recorded when you use the A2X. So you have to make sure that you get the right data there. So how Shopify works, it's they pay, um, pay out the um, lump sum, and that would be included um, the sales, whether it's in New Zealand or overseas, so all your sales, then it would have uh, basically 
um, any refund or return, any gift cards, any information um, that is there, it comes at one lump sum. So what uh, you need to do, you need to break that down. And you can see, for example, this Shopify payment, uh, for example, this one, they would have received $1,951.02. So if I review this, A2X will break it down to this. As you can see, we have an online sale, we had the freight revenue, um, these two had GST, we had international freight revenue, which is a zero rated. They discounted that international freight. Um, some people they say, okay, if you purchase more than a certain amount, you get free freight, free shipping. So that's the case here. Um, they had a freight revenue of uh, with GST of $2.60. They had a Shopify fee that doesn't have a GST there. And they had a normal online sale again for this much. So as you can see, there's a lot going on. And this invoice um, goes, to, um, um, goes to zero and reconciles and, and then accounts for all of these things. So in the beginning, you have to map A2X to uh, make sure that all the accounts are in the right place. Um, for example, this zero rated one in the case that I explained to you that they have to pay 10% GST in Australia, then it would have a 10% Australian GST in there. So it would be uh, again different uh, there as well. So when you go international, um, some of the things are quite different. The other matter that is very important, as I mentioned begin in the beginning, it's everything in accounting is on accrual basis. So when you're on accrual basis, when you receive the money, so for example, let's say this $697. So this $697 that he receives on 1st of March, if you go on 1st of March and say, this is a Shopify sale, it shows in the sales in March that you had $697, okay? But that's not the sales for March. This is a sales on 24th of February because Shopify has got five days delay when they pay you your payout. So, um, the other important part for this is um, having the right uh, income accounted for in the right uh, month. And that's very important. So if, when you receive this invoice, the receive, um, the in, this income will show in February, not in March. And that's how it should be. Uh, lots of people are using other, um, other ones that they send individual invoices to zero and as I showed you before that creates a huge mess and it's almost impossible to reconcile so please do not go that way I'd rather have you guys reconcile the whole thing as a shop for sale rather than sending those invoices because that creates a huge mess and it's very hard to fix because you have to go to individual invoices and try to avoid those invoices which is painful um so make sure that you use a system like A2X. Um, and as I say, all the, all the basically different channels will be covered there and um, you accounted for everything correctly. Um, just a couple of quick things I wanna cover here as well before I hand it to Cheryl. Um, one of the thing you have to do, we are Shopify partner. For all of our clients that they have a Shopify shop, we have access to the Shopify back and then we get the report and reconcile those reports. Even though that we have A2X, we'll still check them against the, um, against the Shopify cell to make sure everything that we have is correct. Um, so make sure uh, if you're using accountants and I would say 99.9% .9 of them that wouldn't have access to Shopify, that they don't want access to your Shopify, they don't understand it. You go to Shopify, you go on, the analytics and go to your finance uh, reports and send them a month by month report for your whole financial year to your accountant. So at least you give them a heads up, say, okay, this is my report from my Shopify sale. If you see a million dollars sales in my account and this shows $800,000, then the accountant's at least gonna ask the question, what's going on here? I don't understand it. And then that conversation starts. Do not assume that the accountant knows everything. So send that report uh, for your accountant to kind of trigger them to ask the question. Otherwise they wouldn't know. Or you can compare it yourself if you understand your accounts quite well. And then on that note, I hand it in to Cheryl. Thanks, Brad. Um, that's very informative. And I'm sure those slides will be really helpful when we share them 
Um, now, for those of you that joined in later on in the session, just to introduce myself again, and I'll also just bring up my slides. So if you could let me know if you can see it. So my name is Cheryl. I'm from a company called Beyond Expectations. And with me on the call today also is my colleague, Sharon Balderson. So we work with Beyond Expectations and the company has been around since 2005. We help our customers with a variety of solutions. In particular, our strength is in helping businesses uh, that need to be able to identify their inventory costs. So this particular part of the session today is really talking about stock taking for end of year, you know, end of year financials, but also not only just end of year, but putting into good practice, perhaps monthly or quarterly, how you could put your stock take process in place um, to help you throughout the year so that when you get to your end of financial year, you're organized. Um, so with regards to what we do for our customers, we help them understand items that are available in stock already, um, being able to understand where they're making money and where they're losing when it comes to items that they're selling. So these are products that they're selling online or in, in store. Okay. Just gonna move on to the next slide here. So just let yourselves ponder this. How often are you currently doing stock takes? And how confident are you in your stock? stock take numbers now do you have any inventory systems in place at the moment um, and these these answers that you might be thinking about in your mind may already come naturally to you because you already have a process in place however there may be um, those that do struggle when it comes to stock takes for a number of reasons and that brings me to my next slide which is roadblocks so um, when it comes to extra work for staff, um, because you don't necessarily have the resources available, you may not necessarily have the time to invest in counting your stock, then you've also got that concern around interruption when it comes to trading. So losing revenue because you don't necessarily have the time to actually do a stock take, you may have to close down for a couple of hours, could be a day or two. So that sometimes comes out of the question. And then of course, completing stock take effectively. So what we're talking about here is being able to actually do the stock take, complete it in the sense where you are able to analyze the data that you've got, and then make sure that you can identify the reasons why there may be gaps in the count that you've currently got. So sometimes all of this becomes a bit of a time exercise and you don't necessarily have that when it comes to running a business at the same time. Um, on the flip side, however, stock taking can also save you a lot of money. So imagine if you could identify leakages and, and the, by leakages, I mean talking about fraud or theft, perhaps even variances and errors that have been made over the time that you've sold products. And because products selling relatively quickly all the time, you don't necessarily have that time to go ahead and check it. But if you just took that time to identify those things, you'd certainly save some money there. Um, providing better customer experience. So when was the last time you went out, whether it was physically in a shop or online, and you found yourself having a shortage of the product that you want to actually order. Or perhaps you've made payment for a product, but it wasn't actually available. How disappointed did you feel? So that customer experience really trickles down and can either build, build up that trust as a customer or it can take you down so you don't necessarily have that loyalty to the brand that you're purchasing. Um, and then, of course, correctly valuing your stock for end of your financial year is also quite important. So trying to manage your stock valuation where you're not overstocking or understocking is quite important so you can keep control and have that accuracy available. All of these things will help you save time and money in the end. Things to consider for stock tech. So 
considering your stock take methodology, you may already have one in place at the moment where you might be um, you know, scheduling in your stock takes perhaps, but if you don't necessarily have that in place, a, a good place to start is thinking about when is a good time, a quiet time to do those stock takes. That may involve having uh, two people to do the stock take, one to actually count the stock and one to record the information. So having this two-prong approach will certainly help manage the visibility of the stock take better and create some accuracy in data because there will be a level of manual data and entry involved. Um, keeping the stock room tidy is also important. So being able to organize your stock in a way that is visible and accessible. So if you've got a warehouse, a particular showroom or front, front store, uh, you may also have just a small office where your stock is, or as in, in, Bra in Brad's um, example of a garage where you've got stock um, if you're a Shopify customer online. Um, so being able to keep that visible and accessible in a way that you can actually move around and count the stock will certainly help. Um, if you do have a warehouse environment where you have the ability to um, store your stock up high on shelves, and, and they may probably be like slow moving stock. What you could probably do is count that in advance. So you already always have a tallied number available on that box that's sitting high up on the shelf where nobody will really touch it. So you can actually have those counts available and ready to go when you are doing your stock take. Um, not to mention updating all your transactions. So making sure you complete your sales order transactions, your purchase, purchasing transactions as well will certainly help. Uh, when it comes to checking variances and recounting those discrepancies, it's always good to have a master sheet of what the original stock take would have looked like and then being able to compare what you've currently counted. Um, then when it comes to the actual discrepancies, highlighting the higher end amounts to identify what those discrepancies are a result of will also help as well. Um, when it comes to writing off obsolete stock as well, so this is very important because you want to get rid of those unnecessary debts that you have, or if you've got particular products that aren't actually selling, there may be an opportunity to sell it through promotions. So being able to write those stock off or be able to sell them off quickly will certainly help get rid of that as well. And lastly, checking the data has flowed through to your accounting system. So this is going to be quite important and your accountants and for those that are listening on the call, those accountants or bookkeepers online, um, they'd certainly be helpful, ha happy and grateful for that information coming through correctly. So um, those are some things to consider. Um, but what's going to actually make it easier to do a stock take? Um, of course, it is a no-brainer to have an, you know, a robust system and inventory system in place perhaps to help you manage that. And you may be in a place where you currently have an inventory system or perhaps you're getting to a place where you're thinking, okay, it's time, I need an inventory system. Um, and then there are those that may be working on an Excel sheet and they may already have some systems in place that can manage what they currently do. But having a system in place that will give not only a business owner visibility, but also your staff visibility will certainly help uh, create some reliability and confidence in the data that you are using when it comes to selling your products to your customers. Um, in addition, you've got things like barcoding products as well. This is also useful, especially when you're needing to scan in high volume goods. Um, through your warehouse or perhaps when you're dispatching the goods as well. So in, in still, installing a barcoding process would be quite helpful. Um, and just as I mentioned earlier, keeping your warehouse organized. So just keeping it tidy consistently will certainly help throughout the times that you're doing a stock take, whether that is monthly, whether that's quarterly or whether that's at the end of the year. Having integrated systems, so systems that talk to each other, which will eliminate manual data entry. Have you considered how much time you're actually spending on manual data entry right now? Um, if you do have inventory systems in place at the moment, 
what are the other systems where you are needing to do manual data entry? Can those be connected together? So those are some things that you can think about. Um, and then lastly, of course, we've got outsourcing that data entry. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you an example of how you could actually outsource that data entry. And so when we talk about outsourcing data entry, get your customers to do the legwork. Does that sound reasonable? Well, let's take a look. So firstly, inventory system. So this is an example of an inventory system that we work with. And what it is showing you right now is a stock take sheet. So it's giving you information about the products that you may potentially want to count. So you can isolate a category and you can count by a particular location. And from here, you can then go through, if you can see the stages here, step, step one, which is search products, step two, which is export the data, and step three is actually update the count. So the scenario is that you've got a product here, a product category furniture. So we've selected some products here, and these are the items that we wish to count. Now, what we want to be able to do is we want to export this data with the relevant criteria. So usually it's going to be cap, uh, you know, the cost, the count, and possibly the product name. Export that data out into an Excel sheet, do the count, and then simply copy it into the third step, which is the green box. And you can then go ahead and process the count. What that will actually allow you to do in your system is basically tell the system how much stock you have. It will identify any discrepancies between the stock and it will create an adjustment as well. All of that happens in a few clicks. And then lastly, what I was talking about when it was outsourcing that manual data entry, it's talking about having the ability to get your customers. So your customers in this situation, for example, could be a stockist, it could be a tradie customer that needs to go in online and process an order to you. And that could be because the usual method of um, ordering from you may be email, it may be um, by phone. So imagine if they had that control where they could go through and select the products that they want to purchase and simply select the items and that order information comes through to your inventory system as a sales order. So you don't necessarily have to do any data entry there. It's simply a case of identifying if you actually have the product available and dispatching it out to the customer. So that will certainly cut some time and certainly save you um, money as well in that process. So with that in mind, if you do have questions and if you'd like to get in touch, you're welcome to email me. Cheryl.Purin at beyondexpectations.co.nz or you can give me a call as well um, if you want to have a further chat about it. But thank you so much for listening and I'm sure you'll have some questions so perhaps we can get into the questioning time. Over thank to you, you Brad. Thank you Cheryl. Uh, just um, one thing uh, I'll add to that is about um, I think Cheryl your um, slides are still on Oh, let's stop that. Yeah. There you go. Cool. Um, so one thing to mention on the top of that is a stock take um, sale. So you see it on all the big shop, they have a stock take sale, a stock take sale. Um, and that is very, very important to move all of your old stock that you think you've been in your warehouse for a while, move it along. Because when you have the stock in your um, uh, warehouse, um, it will be added as a closing stock to your profit and loss report, and it will be added as a profit to you, and you have to pay tax for something that you don't have money for. So if you have a lot of stock sitting there, and that's the reason all the big shops, they do stock take sell, um, is because they want to move the old stock, they want to get cash in, so if you can cover you know, your cost, or cost plus a bit of margin, obviously it would be better to move your stock before end of the year and get a new stock. I know it's a bit hard with some of the um, delays that we have in uh, way of um, delivery from suppliers and all that, but um, if you can do um, your um, stock take sell, that uh, would be good. Also, do not order a lot of stock in March because obviously all of that will be added to your stock. Do it in April, 
um, it saves you um, tax that you don't have money for to pay because it just helps your cash flow. It's not doesn't mean that you pay more tax. It's just that you're paying tax for something um, and you don't have a cash uh, in your bank account to pay those taxes. Um, so, Great points. Uh, the questions, we've got a question about if you purchase different components of the computer, for example, and you build the computer and each component is less than $500, can you claim all of those as expenses? No. If the whole thing become a computer, that computer value would be the total value of um, that. So that's unfortunate. No, the second one is, can I claim on a mortgage interest as expense um, in a house under my husband's name instead of if you guys living there and you contribute to that mortgage, you can claim part of that interest. Definitely, that's not a problem. Um, then there is a question about the bank account. Um, so the person, because this is a long one, you were using the personal bank account and then move um, to the business, use it for business bank account. Um, obviously, there are two or three points here, um, and part of you will answer your question. First of all, make sure that you have a separate uh, business account as soon as you can. This other thing that I have to mention, if you have a company, so if you have a limited liability company, we have seen people starting business set up a company and they use the personal bank account for that company. As a legal obligation, you have to have a company bank account for your company because company is not you. It's a it's a different person. Um, so when we account for the company, that bank account and your balance sheet should be a company bank account, shouldn't be your personal bank account. I know that's not part of your question, I hope, but um, I thought I'd mention that as well for anybody else's um, sake as well. But if you're using your personal account for a bit uh, for, you know, to start your business uh, for a while, uh, make sure that um, if um, the business income or expenses, obviously it's coded for business. If there are some personal income, you put any income that is not related to business as a, um, as a fund introduced and any outgoing, um, going to the bar or whatever um, you spend for your personal stuff, put them as a drawing. So anything coming in drawing, anything going out as, as a, um, uh, sorry, going out as a, drawing coming in as a fund to 